Hi, it's Rob Moore here and I'm with Ken Jocelyn and Ken's doing weekday lives. So we're just talking about um, since the lockdown, Ken wanted to really add value to people and he just started doing lives every single day and it's really become a thing. He does virtual summits. He's had some huge guests. I feel very honoured to be among esteemed company like Grant Cardone, who, as you all know, is a good friend of mine. So I just want to show you, Ken, and say hi to everyone. So this is Ken here. And this is, this is Ken's show. It, uh, I think initially we had on the agenda that we would talk about uh, motivation, passion, um, you know, as an entrepreneur. But I have a feeling that we're probably going to get on well and talk about a lot of things. Uh, and, you know, Ken comes from a place of wanting to add value, as do I. So, Ken, I'm all yours and uh, my viewers are watching live too. Let's go. Good. Hey, guys, I want to welcome you to our Grow Stack Drive weekday live. I've got my good friend, Rob Moore. I actually brand new friend, Rob Moore. I'm all the way from across the pond. Rob, take just a minute, um, if you would, tell our audience a little bit about who you are, um, where you're at, and what you got going on right now. Sure. So, I'm an entrepreneur uh, and... I have written, I think, 15 books now. Uh, probably the most uh, popular were Money, Life Leverage, Start Now, Get Perfect Later. I have a podcast called The Disruptive Entrepreneur, which I've been running now for pushing five years. We're at episode 530-something. Um, I'm good friends with Grant, who I know you're a licensee of, um, Ken, and he's been on my show three times. He's one of only three guests that's been on three times. Grant's always got something to say, and we always have a good laugh. Um, I, I run a property training company in the UK. So I guess in US dollar terms, it'd be about, depending on exchange rate, 25 to $30 million a year training company. Um, I buy properties myself. So I have a few hundred properties that we own uh, in our city. And we're about 70 miles north of London. We started with just really small single dwellings in the last recession. And now we buy bigger commercial units. We're doing 100 unit conversion development at the moment um, and some other developments of that kind of scale. Um, that's a bit about me, really. I mean, there's probably more. I broke the world record for the longest speech a few years back, um, I so I can I talk a little bit. Um, I think I've been yeah. accused of breaking the world official on that. So yeah. talk to me real quick. One of the things we do is we, you know, we obviously we're on here just to add value to our audience, to people going through COVID, obviously in the, in the United States where I'm from, um, there's just a lot going on right now. And one of the things I love to talk to our guests about, and we've got them literally from all different spaces, from um, from entrepreneurs to celebrity chefs to um, you know people and uh, athletes, pro athletes, all kinds of different spaces. One of the things I love to talk about, and one of the things I, I saw in your I saw in your you posted in the last couple of weeks. You said this. You said the enemy of success is risk. The enemy of greatness is comfort and laziness. You need to begin to take some risk and begin to put yourself out there. Make yourself vulnerable and don't be scared to become a student. Dude, and I, I've seen you several times. I've, I've been watching you for a while. When I saw that the other day, dude, that so resonated with my heart about, man, let's take risk. And you say this, and I say this a lot as well. Um, if you risk nothing, you risk everything. Talk to me about why people don't risk. Like, like, what's the inherent thing inside of us that keeps us from risk? I think fundamentally what stops us taking risk is fear. Um, but of course, fear manifests in different forms. Fear could be fear of losing what you already have. Um, so if you've built a fairly successful business, you might not want to lose what you've already built. Um, it could be fear of uh, failure. Uh, it could be fear of rejection and ridicule, which I think is really big. Or what other people think about us. Because I think, imagine if we failed, but no one knew. We probably wouldn't care. We'd try again and try again. But as soon as someone knows and someone talks, then we care. And if you think about it, why does it matter what they think? As long as we're trying our best and we're serving people and we're coming from a good standpoint of, of caring and solving problems, then you, you, we all know the stories of success where failure is inherent within success. Um, and actually, I believe if you want to be successful, you have to be a consistent failure. What I try and do with failure, Ken, is I try and fail small and I try and fail often rather than fail um, not very often, but fail big. So because let's be honest, we don't want to go bust every five years if we can help it, of course. And we don't want to have creditors 
And so sometimes I think we can be a bit flippant with failure. Oh, it doesn't matter because entrepreneurs take risks and that's just a deal. And you lost money. Well, that's just a deal. So I, I am a bit British like that. I probably am. Maybe, I, I maybe don't take massive risks. So what I try and do is little and often risks. One, to build up my risk muscle, because I think we've got an appetite or a capacity um, for, you know, a lot of something or a little bit of something, depending on how much exposure we give ourselves to it. So if we're constantly taking small risks, like I'll risk rejection every single day, Ken. So I'll ask people things I'm scared to ask. I'll push on something. I'll talk to strangers. It's weird. I, I shop down the road and there was a police officer out there. And I thought, I'm going to go up to him and tell him what a fucking good job he's doing. And I don't know the guy. And I felt a little, little bit nervous about that just because I don't know the guy. Because even though I've done what I've done, I'm still nervous talking to new people. I just went up to him and said, look, mate, you're doing, you're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. And that was a little risk. You know, if, if you are asking someone out, you know, if you're single, go ask some people out. Take a risk. Um, and I try and do that every day. I try and get rejection and, and failure every single day. But... Not failure that would break my spirit and soul. Not fa- failure that would risk me going bust. Um, so, yeah, there, there's some of my thoughts on risk. You said, you said flexing your risk muscle. I, I love that. What, what are some, those are small risks. As you, as you build, as you, obviously we know resistance makes us stronger, whether it be muscles, whether it be entrepreneur muscles, whether it be risk muscles. What are some what are some what are some bigger risks besides just talking to the corner police officer? What are some other things that you look to do intentionally to flex that risk muscle? Sure. Well, we've got a project going on right now, which is 85,000 square foot. Um, uh, And I don't know how I put that into context, but um, that's probably 50 to 80 small, reasonable size flats. So it's a big project for us. And uh, in the time we're in, it's hard. It's hard to get labour, um, although that ended up being a positive. We're converting it in. So it was a big department store with two storeys above. Uh, and we fought and fought and fought and got planning to add another two storeys on top. Um, so, you know, fighting against the local planning. Because in England, planning is often a lot tighter. You know, we, we, you can't just build anything anywhere. Um, so our biggest project before that was probably 30,000 square foot. So that's two and a half times the size. So I'd say that's certainly um, taking risk to another level. Um, again, in, in US dollar terms, that'll probably end up being about a $30 million project. So, but, but, you know, we've done a lot of properties before. So we kind of cascaded our, our, our way up there. But that's pro- in terms of sort of financial and business risk, that's probably our biggest risk. I mean, one, one big risk that happened, because the assumption almost in the question, um, Ken, is what's the risk you take that you prepare for? But what about the risk you couldn't prepare for in the lockdown, the COVID, the, you know, the quarantine? I mean, that was the biggest risk to many people's businesses. Um, but w- we, we had a couple of online courses, but we were doing 850 training courses a year. So that's two and a half courses a day. That's, you know, it's a decent size. Probably it, it certainly puts us in the top three size training companies in the UK, I, I believe. Um, and when the lockdown happened, you know, there, there was the very real expectation that we could have zero. And of course, when the quarantine happened, there was zero. And our, our overheads in that company were £800,000, so just over a million US dollars a month. So we had the very real proposition that we could lose a million dollars a month on that business if we kept the staff and kept the overheads the same. Um, and we'd had, like I said, we had two or three online courses and 850 training days face to face a year. And we, bit, we created nine online courses in nine weeks and we've done nearly three million pounds. So what, you know, four plus million dollars in revenue in online courses we didn't even have 10 weeks ago. Uh, and we, we made, we've made £720,000 and nearly a million US um, net profit in the last, I think, three months. I've got to look at the management accounts. In a business model that was supposed to be ruined by the lockdown, um, at, which could have been a million dollars a month the wrong way around. So that was a massive risk to us, but it wasn't a risk we took. But the, ri- the biggest risks you aren't the risks often that you take. They're the risks you, you don't... Pr- exactly. They're the risks, the risks you don't prepare for. They're the things that blindside you. They're not being 
Um, they're being disrupted rather than disrupting. Right. Talk to me about the, so, so, and I shared a little bit off air with you, you know, we started, I had a live event scheduled. I'm a Grant Cardone licensee. Uh, I had Grant on last week, as we talked about earlier, I had a live event in Atlanta. We get in May the 15th at John Maxwell Leadership Center, myself, David Pollock from ESPN's College Game Days, a buddy of mine, um, several entrepreneurs, Richie Dolan from 10X headquarters. We're going to do this first live event as a Cardone licensee outside of 10X headquarters. COVID happens. Yeah. We're not doing a live event, right? So that gets kicked down the road. Yeah. So we start doing Instagram lives. We start bringing guys on. The audience starts to grow, starts to grow. So we said, hey, let's take just a YouTube live and Facebook live and let's start, let's start bringing some, some serious guests on. And we continued to grow it that way. So there was a shift for us. But talk to me about you're facing two and a half months ago, you're facing the fact of losing a, a million pounds or a million dollars, or that'd be 1.3 million or whatever it would be US dollars a month. And you shifted to now, instead of losing, you gain. Talk to me about the moment you guys realize, or you and your senior leadership team realize, COVID's here. We can't do this. We've got to do something else. Talk to me about the, the moment you guys begin to shift and make different decisions to be able to not just survive, but take advantage of and yeah. really thrive through what was thrown at you. Okay, so I need to give you a bit of context to answer this question. Uh, uh, complacency is something that just doesn't happen to me. It just doesn't. It, 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 it's not, I've not just taught myself not to be complacent. I mean, when you've been running a, 15, a business for 15 years and you started with nothing, you, you, you can't be complacent because if you are, you die. You're com- there's always a competitor coming, you know, biting your ankles or whatever. Um, but also, I have too much fear to be... Um, complacent, just from some things that happened in my in my upbringing. So probably a few weeks before the quarantine, Ken, I'll be honest, I was just in total denial. There's no way they're going to lock the world down. That's just not going to happen. Come on. I mean, that's just something out of some kind of movie, uh, like quarantine. <laughs> uh, no way. But then about 10 days, two weeks before it happened, I had a, a meeting with someone uh, and she was like, this is happening, Rob. This is happening. This is happening. And I didn't believe her, but I thought I have to plan in case it does. So I'm a big believer in sort of capacity planning, planning for multiple scenarios, etc. cetera. Um, so 10 days out, I thought, I still don't think this is going to happen. This would be unprecedented, but I need to be ready in case it does. So 10 days, two weeks out, I just started making a plan B, a plan C, a plan D, a plan E, a plan F. I usually get up at five, Ken. I started getting up at four and three a.m., and thought, you know what, if the world ends, um, I-, I need to be ready. Uh, and I knew what my uh, overhead was and I knew, you know, what my cash flow position was and I knew how many months I had. Um, and I didn't, just because I've got money, uh, you know, I-, I became a millionaire at age 30, a UK pounds millionaire. I just say that because it's worth a bit more than a US dollar millionaire. <laughs> um, and, you know, I-, I-, I became financially free before that and I've retired a few times in my life. I'm 41 now, Ken. Um, but just because you've got money doesn't mean you want to sit and let it erode. And of course, we didn't know how many months this was going to burn out at. Three months, it's fine. A year, it's hard. Three years, we're all doomed. Um, so my first thing was, what if we have to reduce our events? What if we have to have no events? If we have to have no events, how do we replace them? OK, if we replace them online, what format do we replace them? What, what trainers of mine are good at selling and, and speaking and selling a concept and an idea online. What courses of mine will work well online and what work? Well, what tech do we need? What staff do we need? What department do we need? I just started planning and planning and planning that. So when the lockdown happened, I was already ready. And when the lockdown happened, I wasn't just ready. I was excited. Now, let me just make this clear. I'm not excited of people dying. I'm not excited of, you know, the quarantine and the awful stuff that's going on in the world. But I am excited for an opportunity. And I am excited that if things are going to go badly, I'm going to kick and scream and fight and and see it as an opportunity. So I figured um, this is a chance for me to create online programs. This is a chance for me to go more global more quickly because we had a global marketing plan that we were executing this year, Ken. But it was going to take three to five years. It was all happening a bit slow. We've got 95 staff and decisions just take so long to get to the, you know, the front line. And that frustrates frustrated me. And everything started happening so much quicker and I loved it. And I'm saying to my staff, you do it. we've got a third of the staff now because the rest are furloughed. 
but you're doing three people's jobs and you're doing it five times as quick. Why couldn't you do this before? And got into this real momentum and um, energy, which I really enjoy. And it's like, that brings back that entrepreneurial passion you have when you start. Because when you start and you're an entrepreneur and you have no staff and no responsibility and no overhead, you have an idea today, you execute today. I want to do a Facebook Live, I'm doing a Facebook Live. I want to create a product, I'm doing a product. And then, you know, like, I mean, obviously Grant's a little bit bigger than me, but I have a decent sized business. And when you get to 20, 30 million a year in just two of your companies and you've got 95 staff, and, you know, like you've got the senior management team and then the lower level manager and then lower level manager. Everything takes so bloody long and it frustrates me. I can't remember what the question was, Ken, but I think I've answered it. No, but I, but I want to I stop you real quick, Rob. You said this. You said we furloughed and I walked in with a third of the staff, but we were doing five times more work than we were before. And you asked yourself, why weren't we doing this before? So why weren't we doing that? Yeah, well, this is the thing. My staff are going to hate me for the rest of my life because any time they do anything slow, I'm going to say, do you remember 2020 when, in lockdown? What we, I'm going to, the story to them is going to be, we built nine brand new online courses from scratch in nine weeks. We should have lost 1.82 million pounds in three months. No, in 10 weeks. And we made that in 10 weeks. So you're telling me you can't do this next week? Bullshit. You're doing it. So I'm just going to be dining out on that forever. I, I, what I think the first thing, and this is just human nature, and you, it, you can't burn on it forever, but it did teach me something. Fear. So some of my staff feared for their jobs, not because of me, because of the, the lockdown. Like the furloughing was obviously a great thing. It really was. I, I, so many people, you know, complain about the government. That was a great thing that they did. Um, they saved a lot of jobs, a lot of livelihoods. Um, but, I, but my staff were fighting for their lives, their jobs, their careers, their livelihoods, their mortgages, their children, the food on their, in their children, on the children's table. And, that, and, and so they hustled like never before. That was the first thing. I think the, ses- the second thing, I think there's a saying, necessity is the mother of invention. Like, where, I, I don't know about you, Ken, but before, I mean, I, I like to think I'm a productive guy, um, I like to think that I know how to prioritise my time. I like to think I know what an income generating task and a key result area is. I like to think I don't mess around and waste my time on Facebook. But once this lockdown happened, I realised there was another level of product- relentless and ruthless productivity. I never knew what ruthless productivity meant. I'm a bit of a softy, Ken. So if someone messages me, I'll reply. If they want something, I'll answer. Um, I'll do things for people. I'll give a lot of my time away. Um, I'll engage on debates online. I'll do it. And- but when this lockdown happened, I was in survival mode. And I was like, you, you, you unsolicited WhatsApp me, you, you don't get a reply. Uh, the, the 150 inbox messages I've got on, on social media, they can wait. Um, any, any criticism, any trolling, any um, Facebook group set up that are trying to campaign against you or your industry, I just block them. Block them, unfollow them. And I, ha- I became ruthlessly efficient. And again, like, I taught myself how efficient I can be thanks to the lockdown. So I'd say fear... Um, focus and ruthless efficiency uh, and, and I guess a more together-centred mission because, because we furloughed you know, nearly two-thirds of our staff, there was just over a third of us left and it was like, okay, we're together, we're more of a team. I don't know if you've seen the film, the, is it 300? You know, there's those three, and there's 300 of them and so they feel more together because there's, there's not that many of them and I think we felt that. Um, and, and, and yeah, hey, look, there's been downsides as well. Like, I think my team miss each other. You know, you can't just go and talk to people and see people. Communication on Zoom, it's great. But sometimes it's not as easy just going to talk to someone in the office. Um, but yeah, you know, I, 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 there's been a lot of lessons from the lockdown. And, and, and to, to a certain degree, it's made me do things faster and more efficiently and effectively and ruthlessly than I probably would have done had it not set in. One of the things you said, Rob, just a minute ago, there's, there's several things you said that I'm like, yes. But one of the things you said earlier was, because of where I came from, I can't be complacent. And the biggest reason I fight complacency is fear. Talk to me about that. Okay, so... Like, like, are, are there, so that, but are there moments where you do feel complacent? No. Creepy? No. Okay. No, I, I don't, I just don't, I don't know... I don't know what's sitting there and drinking your Kool-Aid and smoking your cigar and appreciating what you've got. 
for a good amount of time and relaxing and slowing down and taking your foot off the gas. I just don't know what that feels like. I don't. And, and, and it's, I, I, I've accepted that that's who I am. So I'm listening to an audio book by Curtis Jackson at the moment, 50 Cent. And he's like, there's no, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. You just keep going down the tunnel. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. There's always more to do. There's always another level. There's always another hustler. You know, there's always another industry. And, and, and he said, and I love that about business. There's no end game. And I love that about business too. And I guess in the early years, I used to feel like it was like this endless, tiresome pursuit. When do you stop? When do you retire? When do you relax? When do you breathe? But for me, that, that end destination is now really scary. Why would I want it to end? I just have to find something I love to do. What was the shift, Rob, when you said when I was younger, I was looking for that? What was the shift in you that said, oh, there's, there's not an end game? Dude, I love doing what I'm doing. Yeah, well, I think I taught myself to love what I'm doing for the rest of time because I realised there was no end game, and therefore, if I'm searching for an end game that doesn't exist, that's pain. Also, I fell in love with business and entrepreneurship, and so why would I want to exit something I fall in love with? Why would I want to sell something I fall in love with? Why would I want to retire from something I fall in love with? Because entrepreneurship is my great passion, it's my single great passion. Um, you know, I have some La- a Lamborghini, a Ferrari, sell those tomorrow, take them away from me as long as you ca- I can keep being an entrepreneur. Um, see, when I was um, in my, I was 10, 11, 12, Ken, I was really overweight. I was the, I was the fattest kid in school. There's no other way of saying it. And um, there was a lot of teasing and bullying and it, it wasn't relentless, but I, it, it, I, it scarred me and I remembered the moments. I just remembered you know, some things that, that kids did along the way. And then it, uh, so much so that it became in my head. So um, we, we, we have a, a sport here called rugby, which is a bit like American football. And I used to play because I was the biggest kid. And then the showers afterwards for me were like the, the, the worst torture ever because I'm fat. And, I'm, you know, you, back then all the kids had to shower together and, and I hated it. I hated swimming because you had to wear these tiny swimming trunks. And I just felt such intense shame intense shame from 10 to 13 and it just it just burned into my personality I lost all the way at 12 13 finally girls were interested in me finally people stopped teasing me but the need to be liked appreciated noticed respected admired and valued never went away Ken and it just still burns there really deep so so that's where the lack of complacency comes from it's just still there I, I have a therapist um, I know you guys in America are more open to that kind of thing. In England, if you say you've got a therapist, you get a lot of criticism. Um, it's amazing talking to you, to like you and Spencer Lodge and Matt Soltis, who's a real good friend of mine. It's amazing talking to you guys and hear you guys in America. We do this, but I'm quite British, and so we don't do this. Or even Canadian. Yeah. My friend Nolan's from Toronto, and it's, it's amazing how, how you guys talk to me. Yeah, we're a bit more reserved. And, and you, you know, my therapist says that to me, Rob, I, the, there's the child you and there's the adult entrepreneur you and I see them as two different people and the child you is vulnerable, still trying to be noticed, admired, respected, standing on the edge of the football pitch watching the game because you never got picked, standing outside the edge of the ring where the guys and the girls were getting together behind the library because you never did. And she sees that come out in me and then, and then she sees this adult ca- character I've developed where, you know, I'm, I'm an intense student of personal development. I've read thousands of books. I go on so many courses. I learn from everyone I can. Um, I invest millions of pounds in, in this, Rob, what I, what I see, what I see in you and just following you when you were with Spencer a couple months ago, what I see is I, I see just a beautiful merge of that 12, 10, 11, 12 year old kid who longed for approval, um, would, felt shame over what your body looked like, to this entrepreneur has a platform that's worldwide and, and is crushing it now. And I see the I see the the humility, the not necessarily just the desire to be liked or wanted, but it, it comes across as, as an authentic self or an authentic voice. Does that make sense? Like like that's when I hear you, that's what I hear from you. It's not it's so funny because I've been around Grant so long now um, and we get a lot of one-on-one time together that I get what I call behind the curtain views with Grant. So it's not, I walked up to him at the car. I spoke for the licensee accreditation back in January 
Richie and Grant had me down. I spoke to all the licensees. Obviously, I'm one, and I spoke, and we got done, and I walked outside the front door, and Grant was sitting in his G-Wag, and then Ryan was standing there, and I walked up, and, you know, Grant's like, he has his camera out. He goes, Ken, tell me what's going on in your business. He calls me a preacher, right, because I spent a lot of time in ministry. He goes, preacher, come over here and tell me what's going on. So I'm, he's filming me, and we get done. He turns the camera off, and we're sitting there, and he hands me what I thought was a matchbook. And I looked at it, and it said Cardone Capital and I flipped it open, Rob, and it was a condom. And I just start laughing. And Grant goes, I know you're a preacher. He goes, but that's funny. You know, and I'm dying. And I handed it back to him. And I'm laughing. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not that guy, but yet I'm not that kind of preacher, but that's funny as hell, dude. And then he looks at me, Rob, and he kind of sinks down in his seat in, in his in his car. And he goes, he goes, Man, I've been gone eight or nine days. And I come back and I hear the three or four people laugh. He goes, dude, it just sucks. So I, so, I, so I get to see some behind-the-curtain looks at, with, with Grant, and I see a lot of that in how you post and how you communicate because of that. Does that, does that make sense? And I think that I think that is what makes you authentically you and makes you and gives you the ability to be able to connect with people on the level that you connect with people. I was going to ask you just a minute ago because you said you just kept searching for approval and and those types of things and now as an entrepreneur i was going to say at the level that you've reached the cars you have the money you have the employees you have how much how much of that has shifted from that 12 year old boy for the need for approval to the need of how can i help other people do what i've done i think i've spent a lot of time trying to and i think we all do find what you might call your authentic voice. So me sharing my struggles and the therapy and the younger version of me and the stuff I've figured out and the stuff I'm not very good at is all part of my authentic voice. I'm not brash and gregarious. I get moments when I get very excited um, and that can sometimes be taken as that, but there's too much fear there for me to be, you know, not as out there as Grant, for example. Um, so I feel like, thank you for what you said. I feel like I've found a voice where I'm, I'm not copying anyone. I'm not trying to be anyone. I've got my own style. I think the people who like me for it, like me for it. I'm not everyone's cup of tea and that's great. There's a lot of people trying to be like Grant or Gary or Tony. And I respect those guys greatly, but I don't, I, I want to try and f find and be myself. And so that merge of that younger child who went through that experience and then this, this adult who's been on a massive personal development and business journey, that, that's a flavour of that which makes me unique. I used to be an artist, that makes me unique. I'm, very, I'm quite a creative person, I'm very much into music. And when you add all that together, it makes me something a little bit different. I'm, I'm looking to um, break into America a bit more because you need some more Brits over there. Um, so, and, and I guess I've just... I mean, I teach a lot of people to try and find that in themselves, be themselves. You know, you've got your faith and you've got your, you, you, you know, your, you know, your background and your history in that world. And you and you bring that energy and that element. And I, and, and I think finding uh, people talk a lot about vulnerability and authenticity and integrity. And these words are so loaded. They're such complicated words. I would say it's being comfortable to have a voice where you're not trying to be anyone else and you're okay with who you are. I would say that's, that's what it is. So I'll often just stick a phone anywhere and just record. You know, I've got a studio in the office. There's a big expensive studio. Looks a bit like Grant's. Um, but I'll happily just stick a camera right in my face and talk as well. And, and I think that, that, that's an element of, of, of being yourself. And, you know, it's so hard... It, it, where everyone's got a voice for you to be heard. But I think the best way for you to be heard is not to shout, but is, is just to speak with, from a place of certainty. I'm not particularly confident, Ken, but I am certain. And I think you can be certain and not, you can be humble, a bit vulnerable, a bit, a bit geeky, a bit nervous, a bit quirky. But if you're certain certain that you're an entrepreneur, certain of what you've done for people in the world. I know what I've done to write my books and the work I've put into those. I know how many, the thousands of videos. I know the value I've put out to the world. And I'm certain about that. And even if I'm not that confident and a bit edgy, that certainty, certainty is more important than confidence, I believe.
I love it. I love it. Two questions and we'll, we'll let you run. Um, number what, what's, what's you talked about just being, um, just passionate about personal development and leadership development over the past three months with COVID, what would you say is the one area that you've learned or you've grown in? Uh, what's the one thing you've grown in one area you've grown in more than anything else over the past three months? I would say it's going back to lightning speed. Um, I, I love working fast and um, I believe that speed wins in entrepreneurship. I know, um, you know, Grant agrees with that. Uh, and I think I bought into the excuse that the bigger you get, the slower you get. It's just the natural way. It's like when people say, oh, when your turnover grows, your profit margin goes down. It's just what happens. If anyone says to me, this is what happens. These are the rules. It's the natural way. I'm now going to reject that completely. So I'd say the biggest thing I've learned is to connect back with that speed and, and actually also not buy into other people's beliefs. Because I listen to my senior management team. I listen to um, influencers. I, I listen and read audio books and podcasts all the time. But sometimes people project on you something. Oh, well, this is how it's become. This is what it is now. We just have to accept that this is the way. And I'm going to challenge that. I'm not going to allow people to change my belief on something I strongly believe in. So I'd say they're the two things I've relearned. I haven't learned anything new in this lockdown um, that I don't think I already knew, but I relearned those. The greatest gift this lockdown has brought me is um, two things. One is I go on really long walks now. And it, like, I didn't realise how beautiful my city was until I actually went and walked around the whole place and went around down all these, you know, footpaths that you've never been before. And they go parallel with roads that you never knew. Um, so I'm doing two, three hours a day on average, and that's been a great gift. Uh, and I, na I nail all my WhatsApp voice memos and all my phone calls. And then in this world, we can get stuck behind WhatsApp messages, Facebook messages and email. And you know what? If you want to solve a problem, pick up the phone. If you've got a slightly disgruntled client, pick up the phone. If someone is struggling a bit, pick up the phone. I don't know. I don't know about your language on this podcast, Ken. Pick up the fucking phone because... I had G on here. Like okay, fine. Um, but, you, you know, like the amount of emails and you're copied in and there's a million threads and everyone's getting the communication wrong and people are getting offended. Pick up the phone. Uh, and so I've been on the phone a lot more, just like, you know, back in the day, 15 years ago. Uh, two things I think you'll love. Number one, the motto for all my companies is we jump off a cliff, we build an airplane on the way down. Um, the second thing is I walked into a bar um, I actually walked in a place to grab some food um, after I worked out one night. Actually, it was actually the day I, it was the night I flew back to Atlanta from speaking down at 10X headquarters. And I walked into a bar and I walked into this bar, horseshoe shaped bar, like normal bars. Everybody's, it's packed. I had to squeeze in to get my little pizza, thin crust pizza I'd ordered. Everybody's on their phone. I literally, I don't know anybody there. There's a girl on my left. I grabbed the phone out of her hand, Rob. And I flipped it over face down on the bar. And I looked at all the people. I said, you do realize there's people on both sides of you. Y'all can, can have a conversation with a human being sitting next to you instead of having a conversation with somebody via Facebook or Instagram mm. or something like that. So probably the most important question of the day is who's your football player? Are you a Manchester United fan? We were getting on so well, Ken. <laughs> Um, so the, I'm going to sound like a glory hunter here, but I'm not because I've supported this team since I was, what, two, three years old. I'm a Liverpool fan okay. and we've, okay. we've done it. We're going to win the league. As long as you're not a, as as you're not a Chelsea fan. I'm <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm one of the few guys that have, I, I love, it, dude. I love EPL. I've decided they're back. No, no fans yet. Um, so I'm coming, I'm, I'm coming to England. But one of my, one of my bucket list items is to go to Old Trafford. Um, so I, I've got to come check a match out. I, I love the history of the game. Yeah. Um, I love the, I just, I love everything about it. Mm. Um, everything about people go, it's too slow. They don't score enough. They don't do, I'm like, and I mean, I've been watching this since Rooney was probably 18, 19 years old, probably 03, 04. Yeah. So I've, I've been a fan for a minute. So I absolutely love it. So it's funny because every time I get somebody, one of my British friends on, I'm saying, who's your club? And actually, <laughs> Um, Spencer Lodge. Spencer's a Manchester United fan too, so that was that was pretty cool. So listen, Rob, thank you for thank you a ton for being on today, dude. Super grateful for you. My pleasure, uh, man. Thanks for adding value, and you do, man. I, I appreciate your heart. I appreciate just following you on social media, just seeing you. I, it's it's really really cool connecting with guys. Um, and this is the one thing that I think the lockdown has afforded us 
is just giving us an opportunity to connect with people on a relational level, yeah, um, really on an authentic level that we probably would not have been able to connect in the past. So, dude, just thank you so much for being a part. And you want to you want to sign off on your end over there? Yeah, and why don't you do a shout out for your channel and your show, Ken, to my my guys? Hey guys. Ken Jocelyn at Gross Stack Drive. You can check me out on Instagram at Ken Jocelyn, K-E-N-J-O-S-L-I-N. We've got our Gross Stack Drive virtual summit. It's a live um, summit. We're doing um, June the 16th, Tuesday night, 6.30 p.m. Eastern time, probably a little late over in England, um, till about 9 p.m. Eastern time. We've got um, seven communicators, entrepreneurs, businesses in excess of probably $20 billion. I'm going to be with us communicating 10 minutes of speaker, and then we do five minutes of Q&A for each of those communicators. Phenomenal time. Huge value add to our audience. Would love for you to be a part. Thank you, Ken. And I have a podcast called The Disruptive Entrepreneur, and I sign out with the same saying every single time. I've done this thousands of times. If you don't risk anything, you risk everything. Rob, I appreciate it, buddy. Thank you very Thank much. You. Cheers, everyone. Even